Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to RCSI. Um, this is a bad day for a runner. I hope you would agree if it ends up like this, and that's, that's really where I wanted to start. Um, can I ask if we have runners in the audience? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, great, so a good few. Can I ask you uh, how many of you have had a running-related injury? Well, I'm very glad to see <laughs> that that is not every hand that went up a moment ago, uh, but that's really what I want to talk about. I want to look at take you on a tour of the research, take you on a tour of the evidence, tell you what we know in terms of the extent uh, of the injuries that runners tend to get. And the reason I really wanted to zone into running is we're talking about active lifestyles and one of the really difficult things uh, in main is maintaining an active lifestyle. And running really is becoming very popular and is such an easy thing to fit into your lifestyle. So I'm, I'm flying the flag for running. Um, and what I want to take you on a tour of is the risks. We, we'll really look at risks because in looking at this debate uh, around uh, the risk of injury and your own risk, that's really where we need to look at the literature. Uh, and then let's zone in on what you need to do as an individual because the research currently does not offer us all the answers and we need to think about uh, your individual case. And then no surprise, is it worth the risk? Yes, it's going to be worth the risk. Uh, so let's, b before in fact we answer the question, well what is the current epidemiology on running related injuries? And we're really focusing here not on Sonia but on recreational runners. Um, let's set the scene because I think it's really important to put running in a context of other sports. Uh, and hopefully you can see that at the bottom. So the best way to, to uh, describe risk, um, uh, uh, to describe injury rate I should say in terms of sport is to look at the number of injuries you get per thousand hours and injuries tricky to define but usually it's missing out on a training session or such so in terms of swimming if you can't see it's about four per thousand hours basketball it's about ten in terms of match it reduces in terms of training GAA it goes up uh, hurling it goes up and those two boxes refer to either competition versus training so you see really the high rate is in competition soccer it's high as well and uh, Professor Byrne knows all about that uh, rugby is is the highest so without waiting any longer running fits in at about 10 per thousand hours so it's not so bad uh, in terms of of the incidence of injury uh, in terms of the spread of injury lower leg in particular from the knee down uh, but you might get a little bit of back pain from time to time as well and when we look at the extent of the injuries the average is about missing four running sessions about three and a half weeks so I'm going to zone straight into risk uh, now that we've looked at um, how, how prevalent injuries are or, how, or the incidence uh, and let's talk about the known predictors of injury for all running related injuries the big one is if you've injured before and I think that's really important it has a kind of a lifespan to it in that it really is within the last year. Mileage is another one uh, and weekly mileage tipping the 40 mile mark seems to be a predictor uh, of uh, injury. The more you run the more likely you are to get injured in other words. Um, training profile, the more you include sp speed training seems to be uh, upping the risk. Uh, and interval training, in other words changing your speed maybe at the start, starting with walking, interspersing that with running, that seems to be possibly a bit protective so that seems to lower your risk uh, and the novice runner seems to be a little bit more at risk. We need to talk about biomechanics which is obviously one of the things you'll hear uh, a physio talking about if you end up unfortunately in front of us uh, but that isn't super strong uh, in terms of being a, a predictor of running related injury uh, when it comes to just looking at the static biomechanical alignment uh, and some of you will probably have, have heard some of these terms like genuverum valgum overpronation or have a leg length discrepancy. So what we really need to understand, and I suppose what I want to get to by the end of this, is that you understand um, your risk, your likely risk, you understand your profile of risk, and we'll only get so far with that, but you also understand how injuries happen. And, and in doing that, we really need to understand load, and we need to understand um, how overload leads to injury. So this is an example of two different athletes performing very different activities. Uh, on the right you have Rob Heffernan, our, our world champion, uh, Olympic medal winning recently, uh, Olympic uh, medal winning walker, who's obviously engaged in a very uh, high repetition, fairly low load activity uh, and is well designed for it. 
And we have this athlete over here, hopefully only lifting that on very few occasions, uh, but obviously here we're looking at a very low load. So we can see that they are designed for the task at hand. Now let's think about injury. This is really the important thing, and you want to be on the right side of the threshold here. Um, let's think about this line. So if we look down here at repetition of activity and we look here at load, we want to maintain ourselves functioning and our tissues functioning uh, in this tolerance level. We don't want to cross this threshold because on the other side of that threshold we have injury. Uh, and if we're talking about high load injuries uh, with a low repetition, that's where we, the acute injuries live. Uh, and obviously overuse injuries are going to be from high repetition, uh, low load. Uh, and, and the thing about a runner's profile of injury is overuse injuries certainly dominate over acute injuries. Uh, and so that's really where we're going to zone into further in terms of talking about risk. 70% of runners develop over a year some kind of overuse injury. Uh, and some of you might have already done that. So this is the part of the curve that we're going to be uh, thinking about this end of the curve. And I suppose a couple of things to say about uh, overload. Uh, we have very different tissue tolerances. Uh, within our body but also between us. It also varies with age uh, and I suppose the key thing to think about with respect to age from my point of view in terms of overload uh, is our flexibility diminishes. It doesn't have to but it, there's a tendency towards that happening. And in general, in terms of activities, tissues in general are better able to cope with variable stress rather than the repetitive nature of cyclical loading. So this is a, a jumping ahead, but this, I think, is a really important message. Uh, I'm a working clinician, and this seems to be a message that hasn't quite got out there yet. Uh, and we're going to jump ahead to talking about management. The key thing here when you have an overuse injury is not necessarily to stop unless we're talking stress fracture. Uh, we're talking about relative rest. We're talking about modifying your activity, reducing load. That could be done with running retraining, simply reducing your training regime, biomechanical modification but getting to a point where the activity is no longer painful. Uh, and that's important because if you just rest, and, and time and again we see runners coming in who say, well, I'm here now because I, I had this pain in my knee, I waited for four weeks, I took a rest, and then I went back to running and it was as bad as ever. Um, and that's not the right way to handle an overuse injury. Um, so don't take t rest and, and just wait. Find out what the diagnosis is because obviously if it is a stress fracture, we certainly need to know about it. So this is a profile... Uh, in terms of in the green of overuse injuries that a runner is susceptible to, and in the, the red, the acute injuries. Uh, so really, stress fracture we're more concerned about at the metatarsals and the tibia. Uh, the most common one, though, is patellofemoral pain syndrome, um, and there's quite a few others. So some of those might be familiar to you, uh, depending on your own history. So we don't have time to take a tour of all of these individual injuries, but I just want to focus on a few of them in terms of risk factors, because that overall overall set of predictors that I gave you for running related injury doesn't tell us the whole story. So if we start with the most common runner's injury, patellofemoral pain syndrome, these are the risk factors. So having poor biomechanical alignment, the, the arch being dropped in the foot, being weak in the glutes, that's a risk factor, and being very tight down the back of the leg, that seems to be a risk factor. Moving on to something like medial tibial stress syndrome, which is a type of shin splint. Again, we're not going to discuss it, but it's just risk factors I want to go to. Women are a little bit more susceptible to this. We're seeing overpronation kicking in as well as a risk factor. Being tight around the hips, so this refers to medial rotation at the hip. Not having enough flexibility around the hips has an impact on what's happening at the shin uh, and being inflexible at the back of the, the, the leg as well. And more recent research also suggests smoking uh, and low level of cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, Achilles tendinopathy, which is a big runner injury as well. Um, being stiff at the ankle, so having poor movement upwards of the foot. Again, overpronation is popping out. Uh, again, having poor flexibility and training on hard surfaces uh, definitely seems to be an issue. And almost finally, plantar fasciitis. Now, this one I, I put in here because looking at the age profile along the, around the room, this is really only an issue when we hit this 
midlife and move on, uh, but runners are definitely getting plantar fasciitis as well. Their risk factors are, again, this overpronation and having a statically pronated foot type, uh, being inflexible at the back of the calf, uh, and being on a hard surface, so increased ground reaction force. So when we look at these individual overuse injuries, we are seeing these kind of risks attached, but what I'm saying to you is it's not translating in terms of predictors, uh, in terms of risk factors for overall running related injury, but it's still relevant to us as clinicians. The final one to mention is stress fracture. It's much more complex, this area. You can see by the list of all of these risk factors here, some of which relate to nutrition. Um, the one thing I'll mention here is that the number in terms of running is a bit lower. Over 25 miles uh, running per week, your risk of stress fracture uh, goes up. Uh, training errors can sometimes be responsible, suddenly increasing your training, which is an easy mistake to avoid. Uh, but the reason I mention it is for the young women in the room in particular, that if you're a young runner, and actually you haven't gone crazy with your training and, and overtrained, but you've developed a stress fracture, we, we really need to be sending you to our medical colleagues and getting you assessed in terms of female athlete triad, uh, as that's an important thing not to miss. Okay, so let's go back to biomechanical uh, issues. And let's talk about biomechanics from a static and a dynamic point of view, because basically where the research is going now is towards identifying what people are doing dynamically, much more so than what's happening statically. But when we do look at people statically, this is the kind of thing we look for, femoral antiversion, a rotated uh, femur, uh, the pronated foot, so the inside arch being close to the ground. Uh, it's also possible to have a very high arch, and that increases your risk of stress fracture, tibia and femur. Uh, but these overpronated feet are, as we've seen, uh, definitely going to lead to more likely a risk of overuse injury. Uh, some angulation at the knee will definitely increase loading as well. Um, and so those are some examples of static alignment. But actually, we're much more interested now uh, in dynamic control because when we look at somebody for example unilaterally squat here we want to see this nice pattern of the pelvis being well balanced over the leg and on this side with this girl we're seeing a pelvis dropping on this side which normally points to poor gluteal control so poor uh, glute strength and glute control and angulation in at the the femur uh, and she could very easily be overpronating at the foot as well so why are we interested all of a sudden dynamically because we know that Novice runners uh, have poorer glute muscle activity and they tend to rotate in at the hip uh, a little bit more. Uh, and we know that, for example, runners who have this patellofemoral pain syndrome, our most common running injury, have a similar pattern. And even more than that, uh, they have delayed glute muscle activity. So we know things aren't firing properly up around, let's call it the core, between the tummy and the glutes in particular. Uh, and this is really what's starting to get us much more tuned in to interventions that focus on dynamic control rather than just static alignment. This is a, a large area to talk about, how do you run, and we don't have time to talk about it other than uh, some of you might be interested and in be thinking about how you strike, whether you're rear foot, uh, and if you're wearing shoes, you're very likely to be a rear foot striker, or where you're landing forefoot. And this is really the new area of research, if you like, in terms of running related injuries and uh, running retraining. Um, but what I need to say to you about it, I suppose, is that as soon as you change how you land, and this is only one element of, of looking at how you run, uh, you are changing things along the, the kinematic change and that, uh, chain, and that has an impact kinetically. So uh, to get somebody who was a, a rear foot striker to land on their, their forefoot is better for the knee, uh, but actually it's not so great for the Achilles tendon. So, all I want to put out to you at the minute is that right now where the research is, is it's looking at this biomechanically and starting to look at this clinically in terms of case series, but we are not yet at a point where we'll be saying to you, you should run this way, you should land that way. It's really going to depend on uh, your own injury profile and future research to come. So in terms of what's on your feet, really the issue here relates to how you land again. Um, so when people wear minimal footwear, they're more likely to forefoot strike, which is uh, w what you really want to get out of them using that minimal footwear. But the problem is some people, and you can see Zola Bud here about to rear foot strike, some people still do land rear foot strike, and that's the worst of both worlds. You've taken away their cushioning and they're landing hard on the heel, uh, so that's not going to be uh, thrilling for the plantar fascia. And also there is some uh, research to suggest that people, as they start changing their technique, really increase the load, uh, increase the impact forces. 
so it's a large area of research, but watch this space because we're, we're really learning more about this. So to fast track to what can we do about it, uh, again, let's look at the evidence base around running related injury. Can you prevent it? Because uh, obviously that's really with the space where we want to be. Warm up, yes, there is evidence to say that if you warm up, as long as the focus is on increasing your body temperature, that is protective against some injuries. Stretching is part of your warm up, not so much, and we can discuss that later if people are interested in talking about that. Footwear type, not a huge amount of research. There's, again, that may be more that the, the research is slow to pick up on, on uh, some of these changes, um, but certainly we, we don't yet have a, a so solid research base for telling you uh, what shoe to wear. And biomechanical correction, it's really now, as I said, starting to focus on emerging research that is showing us that dynamic control and changing what people do dynamically, particularly up around their core, is actually what's useful. Uh, in preventing and treating uh, overuse injuries. So as I said, load modification, specifically running retraining and foot strike alteration is only a part of that. I'm not telling the full story. Uh, that's really the space to watch in the future. So what do you do with that information? Because that's not going to get you all the way to minimizing your own injury risk profile. Uh, Here's what I think you need to do if you're a runner or you're about to start running. You need to know more about yourself. You should be able to tell me your biomechanical screen, uh, statically and obviously dynamically as well. You should know your flexibility profile. You should know if you're super flexible. Great if you are. You should know if you're super inflexible. Uh, and then we really need to deal with it, particularly as you age and you want to continue running. Uh, you should know about your proximal core, your, your uh, tummy, there's somebody doing the plank, your glutes. You need to know how strong you are because really what we're saying is to avoid overuse injuries, you need to be strong and flexible. Uh, and in terms of your program, I'm not a coach, I'm not an expert in this, but obviously if you are looking to start, we're talking about a graduated training program. Uh, and if you are interested in making changes to your pattern or footwear, it really does require gradual transition to accommodate to the changes in load. So just be a little careful about that. Secondary prevention means that once you have actually done an injury, because that first risk first year carries such an extra risk, uh, you really need to rehab thoroughly. And as I said, I'm trying to bang the drum for the fact that the emerging evidence is really supporting uh, higher level exercises in terms of the glutes, and there's some glute exercises there, uh, in terms of treating overuse injuries. Okay, so you're not off the hook in terms of stretching and hopefully I've made that point. Uh, and those are some of the stretches that should look very familiar to you and some of you might punish yourselves with foam rollers, which is also another way to go. Um, Professor Byrne has talked about OA and I just wanted to throw this in as a putting it in context of risk for the runner. Um, let's be very clear, having a high BMI uh, and having a history of the type of knee injuries that Professor Byrne described is a much greater risk than being a long distance runner. Uh, and we're talking about elite level long distance running. In terms of low or moderate training volume, there is no risk so far on. Uh, so finally, I, uh, hopefully the debate is clear that I'm on the side of the argument of yes, the, absolutely the, the benefit outweighs the risk uh, for sure, but runners are at risk of musculoskeletal injury for sure. Older runners though are healthier typically than non-runners and even in the case of having osteoarthritis, arth osteoarthritis, a high level of physical activity is still recommended and if you can do that by running, if it's pain free, go for it. Uh, this fits in really nicely with the government's recently launched national physical activity plan, which is trying to get a half a million more of us uh, hitting our physical activity guidelines in the next 10 years. Uh, we don't really have time to talk about this person, but crikey, this is a great case study uh, for us, because his training load was really a bit crazy. He went for 19,000 miles. Uh, and what I'm interested about, uh, if he had come for a screen, I would have been interested in his sporting history, because he did play college football as a quarterback. Did he blow out his meniscus? Uh, he also had a gunshot wound to the buttocks. Don't ask me how I, how I know this, but uh, that would interest me, because I'd like to know, well, does he still have some residual glute weakness? And if I could get my hands on him before, he started those 19,000 miles, these are the things that we would have screened in advance. Uh, and with that kind of mileage, yeah, you really do need to be changing the shoes from time to time. So my take home messages, and sorry for going over time, uh, rec runners, go for it, you're at, it, at risk of increased MSK injury, but not long term osteoarthritis. Consider your own risk profile and modify the, the risk factors that you can, uh, realizing that overuse injuries are most common, but listen to your body, listen to the warning signs and start modifying the load at that point. Um, and really run fast run. Thank you very much. Now, Louise rightly said, which I was really pleased with, which was to say, you know, get fit to yeah. run.
I, you know, that was just perfect. That put the ice on the cake for me. I... <laughs>